Hello booktube. <clears throat> Today we're gonna I'm going to make my review of Jennifer Government by Max Berry. Max Berry is known for his uh, for writing about uh, office culture. If you've ever had a job at a cubicle at a de at a desk and a cubicle, uh, Max Berry's talking to you. Uh, if you've ever worked in a really big company, or if you worked at, um, or if you worked a part-time job like fast food or something, so you working for a company, your work life—that's what Max Berry is known for writing. Um, that 2013 uh, film *Syrup* um, was based on uh, his first novel, ri written in 1999. But uh, today we're going to talk about Jennifer Government, which was published in 2003. So, there you go. Um, so I'm going to cut, I'm going to, there, there's no timestamps because I don't know how to do that yet. But I'm going to try to divide this up into um, sections, if that's right. Uh, first, uh, first there's this introduction. Then there will be... Uh, the the setting of the book, then there's the actual plot itself, and then there's some concluding thoughts. Okay, some concluding thoughts, like what are my overall thoughts? So, Jennifer Government is set in a alternate present, <clears throat> a dystopian world, where where rather than too much political power, there's too much corporate power, or too little government as opposed to too much, or too much freedom as opposed to no freedom. So it's the inverse of George Orwell's 1984. <coughs> so that is a very, very fascinating premise. I wanted to explore that world. Uh, explore those these these questions. Um, now I'll try to I'll try my best to describe the setting of this world, but it's going to be a little bit tricky. So basically, in this world, the government has been shrunk so much, so little that it's only responsible for security, and they don't even hold a monopoly on protecting people from hurting each other. Because everything has been privatized, there's no taxation, there's no government welfare, no government services. They're only responsible for maintaining a few limited <coughs> checks and balances. And the government can only run, the United States government by the way, can only function as long as there are people willing to give donations. So the government has to go out and do fundraising so that they can run their, their minuscule programs. This world is run by corporations, <coughs> by companies. And they, so the, uh, your entire value of who you are as a person depends on you having a job. Because there's no, because there's no social safety net in this, in this world. And there's no um, no family values or culture or anything like that. It all everything in everything quite almost not literally, but everything in this world runs based on if you can pay for it. Uh, your entire value is whether you can pay for any service. Now, <coughs> in this world political borders around the world are starting to disappear because corporations want it that way, so there's a unified country. Political borders is not good for the profit motive. Nationalism is not good for the profit motive. So countries are merging. This Most of this story takes place in Australia because Max Berry is Australian. And Australia has merged with the United States of America with several other countries and some of them are and those that have not merged with the United States the remaining countries in the world that have not merged 
are considered uh, socialist states. <coughs> this new world ideology is called capitalism. Now, this is all very hard to comprehend. But, uh, so that's why I would encourage you to read this book, because it's very difficult for me to explain this book. Now, just to, so you know, this is not a warning. It is not, okay? It is not a warning about a future society. It is a dystopian novel, but it is not a warning of a dark future society. Instead, it is an illustration of how ridiculous and absurd um, libertarian economics are. Ron Paul economics are. Why Ron Paul? Ron Paul is the most prominent person for saying the smaller the government, the better. And uh, this is the ultimate libertarian wet dream. It is not a warning of a future society except in one area. And that is having to pay for emergency services. There's a scene in this book where a character has to pay with a credit card for an ambulance and because he couldn't pay on time, the person he was trying to help died. Uh, there was actually a similar story to that uh, in the United States a few years ago. I believe it was in 2009 or 2010, <coughs> where a uh, where a fire com uh, where the firemen in a town in Tennessee, I believe it was Tennessee. I could be wrong were privatized and then they and then when somebody who was behind on their payments to the fire company called saying that their house is on fire the firemen don't come then that fire spread to a neighboring house and the neighbors did pay on time and they called and the firemen came and put out the fire of the neighbor's house and the first and the or uh, and the how and the first person the person who made the first call said help help put out the fire put out the fire of our house is burning down our dogs are in there they're dying fireman said nope you didn't pay and they leave and the dogs were and the dogs died this is a true story um link in the description if i can find it i will try uh, there's a, there's an there's an old article. I will try to find it on the internet. No promises, though. No promises. Uh, link in the description of this incident. So, but Max Berry doesn't go further into that, into the aspect of the normal daily lives of people. Um, other than that, uh, it doesn't talk about what life would really be like without food stamps what life would be like without any government services. Everything, else, everything in this world, you have to pay for it. But, <coughs> um, so, there was not enough. Uh, I'm going to segue into the plot in a moment. And also in this world, because everything, um, your entire value is based on whether you can pay for it, Loyalty is to your job and not to your family. So when people get a job at a company, they adopt the last name, which is the name of that company. So if I worked for Coca-Cola, my name would be William Coca-Cola. Uh, there's also, uh, there's some, I'll give you some characters. Hack Nike, Nike, Nike is a shoe company. Um, or uh, your last name would be Exxon, Exxon Mobil. <laughs> Um, just name any big brand company, Sony, uh, Toyota, or whatever. There are, there, just name the biggest brands that you re instantly recognize. And the people who work for that specific brand, that's their last, they, they adopt the last name of that group, of that uh, company or that product. It's absurd. <coughs> um... So people working for the government will be called Jennifer uh, government. That's one of that's the main character, the main character in this book. One of the 
the main protagonist in this book is Jennifer Government. Because she works for the government, hence her last name is Government. She has a barcode tattoo uh, under her eye. Um, I don't remember the backstory behind that. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't remember. But she has it, that barcode tattoo. But that's on to the plot. Um, one last thing about this world. Uh, uh, company loyalty, fierce, fierce loyalty to the company and... Uh, is actually something that exists. You don't adopt the last name of the company, but the company you work for is your entire identity. Uh, that kind of culture exists in Japan. Uh, people who overwork and die at their workspace. They literally crash their head on the keyboard because they're just working, working, working. Their fierce loyalty to the company. Uh, in Japan, there's this toxic company culture where you're hired for a, uh, for a job and that will be your entire life until retirement and you're, you're, you're fiercely loyal to the company and you overwork, you overperform. So uh, that kind of culture, loyalty to the, to the company does exist. Okay, now on to the actual plot. Uh, I don't have to say much about it. There's a lot of interconnecting characters. Oh, one last thing about this world. Your security also depends, your physical security also depends on how much you can pay the privatized companies, how much you can pay the government, how much you can pay the NRA, the National Rifles Associate, Association, or how much you can pay the police. And all of these companies, most of the world's companies, have merged into two large groups. One, is a, one of them is called Team Advantage. And then the other one was, I don't remember, United something. Uh, I don't remember. But uh, these are two um, loyalty programs. So then you can, you can get some, something like a, a credit card where you pay... And then the, where you pay with that credit card and the companies that are part of that credit card, a part of that loyalty company, you can pay with that card. So there are like two teams in this book. And the police and NRA are, I believe, on opposing sides, I, if I remember correctly. So loyal, two loyalty card programs. Uh, I would encourage you to read this book. To know the first, uh, the second one was Team Advantage. The first one was much bigger. I don't remember what it was called. Um, I, I don't remember. I, it just slipped my mind. I believe it's United, United something. Um, <coughs> again, don't quote me on that. Anyway, now on to the plot. So, a low-level worker, uh, an ad, a guy whose responsibility is to make advertis advertisements and posters for the Nike shoe company. One day, his name is Hack, Hack Nike. It's, some of these characters' names are really weird. His name is Hack Nike. And one day, <coughs> he's approached by one of the company bosses who says, um, would you like to make a lot of money? Sign this contract. And he signs it without reading the fine print. The moron. And <clears throat> in that contract, he is contracted to shoot up a bunch of teenagers, sorry, shoot up a bunch of people going to the Nike shoe store when uh, to hype up a new brand of sneakers that, that Nike is selling. So they, they roll out the advertisements and then there's crowds and then he kills them all because he wants to be, uh, supposedly, he wants to be the first to get his hands on these new pair of shoes. So that's, that, that, in, that in itself is ridiculous. So he's contra contracted to kill a whole bunch of people who are rushing to the shoe store to buy these new sneakers and then that hypes up the demand for these shoes that they're purposely that they're purposely making limited editions of 
So then that people will struggle for it. People will clamor for it and then they will, I don't know, make more money from it, make them more expensive or artificially cheap, artificially expensive. I don't remember. But it, uh, it makes people th uh, perceive that, oh, someone's willing to kill for these shoes. Let's go buy them. <laughs> Excuse me. So, he gets afraid and then he reports to the police. And the police say, well, you know, we could, we could, you could contract us to do, subcontract us to do the job for you. And it goes on and on from there. And there's a whole lot of interlocking characters. But that's the most important part of the plot. The next most important part of the plot is Jennifer Government herself. So John Nike, the character who hired Hack, uh, he has like, uh, Je Jennifer Government is on to his scheme of uh, killing people for the profit motive. So she wants to legally bring him down, but she can only, she can only function as much as she can pay for the investigation. Uh, if that makes any sense. And then later in this plot, we it's, it's learned that John, John Nike has an even bigger plan for world domination via, via monopoly. <clears throat> By, via company monopolies. So, it's a crazy, crazy story. But it does illustrate how ridiculous this society is where everyone's minds is only focused on the profit motive. I'm going to read you some passages in the next part of this video. I'm going to read you some parts of the book to illustrate. Now, but, so, this is not, like I said earlier, this is not a warning about a future society, how, of how society can devolve, but how ridiculous libertarian economics are. And, the book is, uh, at first I didn't like it because the characters are like cardboard cutouts, they're shallow thinking, and the world is not further explored. So, oh, that, that's going on into my uh, concluding thoughts. Anyway, so I've already told you the story. Here are my concluding uh, thoughts. How much, how far would I, uh, how would I rate Jennifer Government by Max Berry? I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10. Now, <clears throat> even though I marked it 7 out of 10, I would still recommend you read this book. Because at first I thought I didn't like it because it didn't explore deeper as to how this world came about. It doesn't explore the lives of people without a social safety net except for the emergency services thing. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a cough there. So, at first I didn't like that, the characters are cardboard cutouts and, all, and, uh, and it doesn't dive deeper into the nature of this world. But, it did give me a lot of laughs. So, when you read this book, you'll find yourself laughing. It's a very, very funny book. So, it's 7 out of 10 only because Max Berry doesn't dive deeper into ordinate, it, um, I already explained why, it doesn't dive deeper in, uh, so I kind of wanted more, even though this is 300 pages, um, so I kind of wanted a lot more from this book, so I was a bit disappointed, but it grew on me, at first I thought I didn't like it, but then I thought, oh yeah, this book does have some merit, <clears throat> 7 out of 10, um, so, yeah, the, I, I would, uh, I would encourage you to read this book. Now, if you disagree with Max Berry's thesis, with Max Berry's idea of uh, how ridiculous libertarian economics are, I would strongly encourage you to read this book and tell me where he is wrong. I want, you, I want us to have an open conversation about this. Do I personally agree with Max Berry? I agree that, uh, well, he says this is a warning about a future society. I don't agree with that. I see it as a, um, I see it as an illustration of how, sh uh, how ridiculous and shallow thinking uh, it is. How uh, ridiculous and shallow thinking libertarian economics is. 
I'm sorry if I repeat myself. Tune in later for the next part of this video. I'm going to read you a few passages from Jennifer Government. Stay tuned. Um, uh, I'm going to segue into next clip. Okay, this next clip will be <clears throat> me telling you all of the things that I wished I had said in the first part. Now that I can edit my videos, I can add additional material in. So uh, I forgot to mention in my initial clip that um, the German translation of this book was called Logoland, uh, which is interesting. And the images I get from this book are that of um, glossy shopping malls and uh, office buildings with people in suits and ties and boardrooms. It's actually a very pretty picture if you think about it. <clears throat> um, yeah, logos, I like looking at logos. They're all very pretty. And uh, I like shopping malls. They are, they're a reflection on consumerism and consumerist society but they nevertheless are beautiful interiors. So that's the images that are conjured up as I read the pages of this book. Uh, the first uh, credit card, uh, the first uh, alliance of companies that uh, I was talking about, it does not have the word uh, United in it. It's uh, uh, US Alliance. So it's US Alliance versus Team Advantage. Um, was there anything else I wanted to say? Oh yeah, the government, uh, <clears throat> the United States government has done away with elections in this book because elections cost money. And it's not like there are lawmakers and proposing any more new laws, right? Right? There is a president in this book. Um, y you'll see him later. He's part of... Uh, uh, He's part, or not part of, but uh, he is involved. Uh, it involves the plot point of John Nike's uh, further plans for world domination. One last thing. Um, uh, I wish Max Berry explored uh, the fact that we live on a planet of finite resources. Um, infinite growth in the profit motive, we need a new way of thinking. The fact that companies can only grow so large. Um, infinite growth is not something sustainable because we live in a, on a planet of finite resources. So I, that was, that's actually one of the biggest regrets. I really wish uh, Max Berry had covered that in this book. Allow me to read you chapter two of this book and a little bit of another chapter in uh, I, th I think it's chapter three so let's read shall we chapter two uh, here is an illustration of what you what to expect when you read this book until she stood in front of them Haley didn't realize how many of her classmates were blonde it was like a beach out there she'd missed the trend Haley would have to hot foot it to a hairdresser after school. When you're ready, the teacher said. She looked at her notes, her note cards, and took a breath. Why I Love America by Haley McDonald's. America is the greatest group of countries in the world because we have freedom. In countries like France, where the government isn't privatized, they still have to pay tax and do whatever the government says, which would really suck. In USA countries, we respect individual rights and let people do whatever they want. The teacher jotted down something in his folder. McDonald's sponsored schools were cheap like that. At Pepsi schools, everyone had notebook computers. Also, their uniforms were much better. It was so hard to be cool with the golden arches on your back. Before USA countries abolished tax, if you didn't have a job, the government took money from working people and gave it to you. So like the, the more useless, so like the more useless you were, the more money you got. No response from her classmates. Even the teacher didn't smile. Haley was surprised. She'd thought 
that one was a crack up. But now America has all the best companies and all the money because everyone works with works and the government can't spend money on stupid things like advertising and elections and making new laws. They just stop people stealing or hurting each other and everything else is taken care of by the private sector, which everyone knows is more efficient. She looked at her notes. Yep, that was it. Finally, I would like to say that America is the greatest group of countries in the world and I am proud to live in the Australian territories of the USA. A smattering of applause. It was the eighth talk this period, she guessed. It was getting harder to work up enthusiasm for capitalism. Haley headed for, the, for her seat. Hold it, the teacher said. I have questions. Oh, Haley said. Are there any positive aspects of, to tax? She relaxed, a gimme question. Some people say tax is good because it gives money to people who don't have any, but those people must be lazy or stupid. So why, so why should they get other people's money? Obviously the answer is no. The teacher blinked, he made a note. That must have been an impressive answer, Haley, uh, uh, Haley thought. What about social ju justice? What? Is it fair that some people should be rich while others have nothing? She shifted from one foot to the other. She was just remembering. This teacher had a thing about poor people. He was always bringing them up. Um, yeah, it's fair. Because if I study really hard for a test and get an A, and Emily doesn't and fails, renewed interest from the class, Emily raised blonde and blonde eyebrows <laughs> then it's not fair to take some of my marks and give it then it's not fair to take some of my marks and give them to her is it the teacher frowned Haley felt a flash of panic another thing in non-usa countries they want to they want everyone to be the same so if your sister is born blonde then the blind then they blind you to make it even is born blind, not blonde. Is born blind, then they blind you to make it even. But how unfair is that? I would much rather be an American than a European Union person. She gave the class a big smile. They clapped, much more enthusiastically than before. She added hopefully, is that all? Yes, thank you. Relief. She started walking. A cute boy in the third row winked at her. The teacher said, Although Haley, they don't really blind people in non-USA countries. Haley stopped. Well, that's kind of hypocritical, isn't it? <laughs> the class cheered. The teacher opened his mouth, then shut it. <coughs> Haley took her seat. Kick ass, she thought. She had aced this test. One other, t uh, one other uh, funny moment in this book that I'd like to share is when Hack Nike... Um, uh, spills a bucket of blood a, uh, a la Carrie Stephen King at a Nike store shouting corporations are evil the customers in the shop are like is this a publicity stunt or something <laughs> so funny one last one last passage and this one's not an entire chapter this is just um, a snippet from I believe it's chapter three. Yes, from chapter three. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, here it is. Here it is. Pearson pressed his fingers together. Well, I appreciate you coming forward with this. You did the right thing. Now, let me take you through your options. He closed the notebook and put it to one side. First, you can go ahead with this Nike contract. Shoot some people. In that case, what we do if we retained... In that case, what we'd do if we were retained by the government or one of the victim's representatives is attempt to apprehend you. Yes, and we would apprehend you, Hack. We have an 86% success rate. With someone like you, inexperienced, no backing, we'd have you within hours. So I strongly recommend you do not carry out this contract. I know, Hack said. I should have read it, but... Second, you can refuse to go through with it. 
that would expose you to whatever penalties are in the con in that contract. And I'm sure I don't need to tell you they could be very they could be harsh, very harsh indeed. Hack nodded. He hoped Pearson wasn't finished. Here's your alternative, Pearson leaned forward. You subcontract the slayings to us. We fulfill your contract at a very competitive rate. As you probably know from your oh, from our adver advertisements, your identity is totally protected. If the government comes after us, it's not your problem. And then Hack said, that's my only alternative? Well, if you had a copy of the contract, I'd tell you to go talk to our legal branch, but you don't, do you? Um, no. He hesitated. How much would it be to... Pearson blew out his cheeks. Depends. You don't need specific individuals done, right? Just people who buy these Mercury shoes. Yes. Well, that's cheaper. We can make sure we don't take out anyone with means for, you know, retribution. <laughs> And you need ten, and you need ten caps, so there's a bulk discount. We could do this for say one fifty. One fifty what? Grand, Pearson said. One fifty grand. Hack. What do you think? <laughs> need I say more? Read this book.